Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Professor Nilima uh, Seagull today. Uh, Nilima received her bachelor's degree in physics and mathematics from Yale University and her PhD uh, from Rutgers University. She has been a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford, followed by Princeton University before joining the faculty at Stony Brook in 2012. Uh, she is now an associate professor in the physics and astro astronomy department at Stony Brook University. Uh, as many of you know in this audience, Nilima is an expert on cosmic microwave background, has been one of the main uh, scientists on ACT experiment and the next generation of the CMB experiments. Um, and we'll hear more about that in this talk. On a personal note, I think I first met Nilima in one of Aspen's winter conferences, and as is naturally expected from bringing scientists together in conferences, it immediately led to a collaboration, which in this case was hiring a ski trainer to improve our skiing skills. I don't know if you still remember that. Yes, I remember the chairlifts, yes, <laughs> discussions. Anyway, so welcome to our virtual seminar, Nilema, and without further ado, I leave the stage to you. Thank you. So um, I, thank you so much for having me. Um, I just want to double check again with like a head nod that you can see like a little tarot here. Okay, very good. So I want to tell you a little bit about um, the cosmic microwave background and gravitational lensing and using it to map the dark matter distribution on both large and small scales. And um, okay, what I'm going to do is bring everybody a little bit up to speed just because I know there might be um, some people where the CMB is not your field. So I just wanna bring us all up to the same spot. And then I wanna tell you about some recent results that we, that ACT put out um, in specific on de-lensing and this new technique to probe, to potentially probe new physics. So this paper came out just in November and actually is now um, published in JCAP. And then I want to tell you about a new technique to probe dark matter particle properties and this new proposed experiment called CMBHD. So just to dive right into it with the cosmic micro background, here is the picture that I'm sure everybody is very well familiar with. This is the Planck data. Uh, remember the cosmic micro background is all around us and it's just projected into this oval shape. And um, here, it, when we see the cosmic microwave background, then what we're looking at, this, so this is time, right? So this is the Big Bang, and this is us today. And this orange red stuff is basically um, the hot universe where um, electrons and protons are all free and swimming about in a soup and the photons are scattering once every three weeks and bouncing in all directions and so the photons never come to us. And what the critical thing that happens at 380,000 years after the Big Bang when the temperature drops to about 3000 Kelvin is that the hydrogen atom first forms. And when every proton can capture an electron and hold it close, that allows the photon to free stream and travel all the way from this um, epoch all the way to us without scattering again. So we say that's when the universe went transparent. And those photons that we see are basically coming to us from what we call this last scattering surface. And that is basically giving us this baby picture of the universe 400,000 years after the Big Bang. And we can, it's basically the same thing when you look at a layer of clouds and you see that last cloud surface, but you cannot see up into the cloud. So you just see that last scattering surface, that last cloud layer, and that's the light last scattering off the clouds and coming into your eye. So that's a picture that we see. And over the years, we've been getting better and better pictures with COBE, then WMAP, and then Planck. And you can see how the resolution has been improving as well as the sensitivity. So now here with Planck, you can see lots of small structure. 
After Planck, we have a whole host of ground-based experiments. I, I've written ACT and SBT, of course, there's CCAT prime, um, and there's some balloon experiments, glass TNG, Tol and uh, Toltec is on the ground, um, and a whole bunch of other smaller experiments in the South Pole. So the point is, we've got a lot of ground-based experiments that have even an order of magnitude um, improvement or you know, factor of a few improvement over Planck, as well as much better sensitivity. And I, I will tell you about some recent ACT results since I'm on ACT. So here, again, just to give you a visual of the picture, this was what we had in 1994. You can sort of keep your eye on this cold spot and see how still appearing in the later data, but you can see how the resolutions improved and here's playing. So um, you can see that we have a much better picture today. And from that Planck data, we have this iconic now power spectrum where the blue points are the data, their error bar is here, they're just so tiny you can't see them. And the red curve is fit by a six parameter model. So all of these data points that um, are to first order independent are fit by this six parameter model, which is very, very impressive. And for those not as familiar with what we are talking about when we talk about this power spectrum, here is an animation that I'll show a few times. So this is the cosmic microwave background, but as um, the movie goes on, it's being filtered at smaller and smaller scales. So I'll show that uh, movie a few times. So this is the largest scale. And if you look at this little inset over here, this is a small cutout of the map. And you can see on large scales, it's pretty uniform. If you look at a little cutout. In this inset, this is going to be showing you the power spectrum. So the little, the little cutout is showing you um, fluctuations. And what um, you have to ask yourself is what is, um, what it, how large are the fluctuations? So how much red and blue do you see in the little patch? And calculate the root mean scatter of the fluctuations, so the RMS fluctuations. When the difference between red and blue is very big, that's when you see this power spectrum going up. So it's gonna peak at about um, one square degree and then it's gonna go down again. So that's all the power spectrum is. It's just looking at a little patch, calculating the RMS fluctuations and then um, plotting that. So that's the, that's the power spectrum. So that's what we're seeing here. And the other component that I want to discuss in this talk is gravitational lensing. So gravitational lensing is when you have a background source and the light's coming to us, but there's some intervening matter distribution, which is bending the light. So this effect was predicted by Einstein and we see it all the time, like in these strong lensing arcs in optical data where this is a galaxy whose light has been bent. So, so gravitational lensing is a great way to probe the matter distribution directly. And when we talk about CMB lensing, and this is a picture everybody shows, um, the backlight is the cosmic microwave background. All this purple stuff here is the matter distribution, largely the dark matter. So all this purple is the dark matter. And the light is getting deflected as it travels through this dark matter. So that's CMB lensing. And here is a simulation of an unlensed CMB patch of sky. So there's no lensing here. And then if you add lensing, this is what happens. So it's this little teeny heartbeat that we're looking for, this little change. And since it's such a small signal, um, it was seen for the first time uh, in 2011, I think by, by Kendrick um, and collaborators, Kendrick Smith, who's a PI and collaborators in cross-correlation analysis, and then in um, uh, 2014 directly um, through, in the, through ACT data. So let me dive a little bit deeper into CMB lensing, and this is going to be the hardest slide of my whole talk. But I want to tell you about two things that lensing does. 
So we talked about the CMB power spectrum. And what happens when you increase the amount of lensing, so AL will be like the amplitude of lensing and it'll go from zero to 10. So 10 is extreme, but we're just dialing up the amount of lensing. What happens when you dial up the amount of lensing is you take this power spectrum that we talked about and you actually um, make the troughs shallower and, and also the peaks shallower. So basically you're smoothing out the power spectrum, right? You see, you're sort of like washing out the sharp structure as you dial up the amount of lensing. So we say that lensing, the first thing that it does is it smooths the power spectrum. And we call a power spectrum a two point function because um, you, you basically square the map to make the power spectrum. The other thing that lensing does is what we say is it creates a non-zero four-point function. And it, it does this because it, it um, adds some non-Gaussianity to your map. So what that means is that when I take a power spectrum, which is two maps and I just square them, um, if my multiple here in Fourier space is not the same, so like this is L and this, this is L plus, this is little l plus big L, and this is little l. So these multiples are not the same. If my map was just the primordial CMB, which we know is basically Gaussian, this quantity, this squared um, temperature times temperature, but with the L's different, would give me zero. And what happens is if you have lensing, this quantity becomes proportional to the dark matter map doing the lensing. That's phi. That's the dark matter map. So what I can do now is apply a fancy, fancy filter um, developed you know, by other people. And I, I, this, what this filter does is it basically looks for the very specific way that lensing couples modes together. So I apply this special filter to my temperature maps and out pops an estimate of my dark matter map. And then I can square that dark matter map and make a power spectrum of the dark matter map, which is telling me the fluctuations of the dark matter map on different scales. So again, it's the hardest slide of the whole talk, but the reason why this is called a four point function is because to make this quantity, I have four temperature maps in here. So the two I had originally, and now I square it to make what we call um, the lensing power spectrum, which is really just the dark matter power spectrum. Okay, so this quantity is the dark matter power spectrum. So this is the four point function and it's additional information that I have. And when you plot it, it looks like this. So this is the dark matter power spectrum. And this is the theoretical prediction in black. And it's actually been measured. So um, here's the whole history, actually. So the first idea that you could measure this dark matter power spectrum was like in 1987. And then a number of theorists showed how you could do it with different estimators. Oh, I'm sorry. And I, I got my dates mixed up. So, so Kendrick Smith, the Smithson and Dore analysis was in 2007. And then the first act detection was in 2011 closely followed by the SPT detection. And now Planck has a 40 sigma detection of this lens of this dark matter power spectrum. And that means that they've measured the amplitude of this thing to about 2.5% precision. And of course, with the future data sets, we're, we're going to do better. So since I mentioned ACT, let me just show you a picture. So this is the Atacama Desert. Um, this is the telescope, this is the ground screen around it, and here is the happy collaboration. So, uh, more happy than others at some time, you know, uh, everybody's pretty smiling here. And um, here are the different institutions involved. So um, not a huge collaboration, um, but a lot, a lot of institutions. And okay, so now um, we had a number of recent results, including a result on H naught confirming Planck measurements of H naught. I want to talk about work that was led by my grad student, actually two of my grad students, um, concerning delensing. So what what is
I told you about lensing. And here's a little sort of exaggerated picture of what lensing does, because I've got like a big dark matter distribution here, lensing the temperature map. And so th this is what we measure. I didn't mention two additional things, which is that the CMB is also polarized. So it's polarized into an E-mode polarization and a B-mode polarization. So this is what you would measure with a very large mass distribution. But what would be really nice to have is this, where you separate out the primordial CMB and the mass distribution that's doing the lensing. So the primordial temperature map would look like this. The E-mode map would look like this. Here would be the mass distribution doing the lensing. And the reason why the B-mode map looks blank here is because the only primordial B-mode signal you would have is from primordial gravity waves generated from, from inflation, say. And in this simulation, they don't have that. So it's just blank. So uh, Dila, Dila, sorry, yeah. is it okay if I interrupt? James yeah, has yeah. one question. Go ahead. <laughs> James, would you like to go ahead? There we go. Um, thanks. I was just wondering, I mean, there may be no um, sort of answer to this question, but it's funny to think about measuring the fluctuations in the CMB and the dark matter power spectrum as two different things. So I wonder, you know, has anyone thought or is there any kind of model in which those things are decoupled or different physically? Because because obviously in the standard cosmology, the two are closely related, right? So I was sort of wondering about that. I mean, what does it really mean that we've measured the matter power spectrum separately at lower redshift? Like what's the implication? Well, well, so exactly what I'm going to um, touch on is that our, our lambda CDM model, exactly as you're getting at, predicts a certain amount of matter distribution, right? And so um, when we specifically with this four point function measurement, we are essentially measuring the matter distribution set independently of what that primordial CMB is. And what one thing that you then can do is look for consistency. And this becomes a test of new physics. So like if, if the prediction of your lambda CDM model predicts a certain amount of mass distribution and you measure something different directly with this four point function measurement, that would indicate your model is not correct. So maybe that there's some new physics, for example. Does, is that answering your question? Yeah, yeah. I, I guess I was thinking especially like, is there an obvious new physics that would come in? What's the kind of lowest order new physics that would produce a difference there? Right. Uh, I, so specifically why we were looking at this is because papers that were investigating the h naught tension, like this Hub, um, Hubble Hunter's Guide by Lloyd Knox and, and Marius Milieu, so, so you know, there's this H naught tension where the low redshift and the hot and the CMB are giving different values of H naught that are differing by like three or four sigma, and that paper and some other works like by Mark Kiminkowski were suggesting that maybe lensing is playing a role, and the reason they thought that is because the Planck data was saying that there looked like. Um, 20% extra lensing in the power spectrum, then you would expect from the best fit lambda CDM parameters. And so people were wondering, well, is that a sign of new physics? And is H not also pointing to that because the things were pulling in a direction where if you lower the amount of lensing, you got a consistent H not. So that's why we investigated whether the gravitational lensing is all consistent or whether there's a problem. So that, that was one of the motivating reasons. Is that? Okay, thanks. Okay, okay, cool. So I'm gonna anyway say, say this. So it was great to um, just provide the motivation of, of why we were investigating this. So anyway, so what, so what we, so delensing is just the act of separating the components, the primordial CMB and the mass distribution 
and as we discussed, also looking for consistency with everything because um, given the primordial CMB and general relativity, you also predict the mass distribution. So, um, so we have, well, we have a couple of other motivations for delensing as well. So one is this one where delensing also allows us to tighten our cosmological parameter constraints. And if we, if we look back at this picture, we can sort of see that here I've got two effects convolved together. I've got the primordial CMB and the mass distribution. And if I just remove the mass distribution, um, I have tighter constraints because I don't need to marginalize over some unknown mass distribution. So the active delensing um, leads to tighter parameter constraints. So that's one motivation. Um, the other motivation, as I talked about with the B modes, again, if we go back to this picture, is that there are no primordial B modes except um, for those generated by gravitational waves from inflation. Um, the, the exception to that, as you can see in this picture, is lensing. Lensing turns some primordial E modes into B modes. So when you delens and you remove the lensing distortion, you can see, you can have a cleaner picture of whether there are any primordial gravity wave B modes underneath. So that's the other reason one wants to delens, to remove the lensing B mode signal. And then the third thing, which uh, I was just touching on, is that that allows you to do the cons this consistency check of the lambda CDM model, where I told you there's lensing in the two-point function, there's lensing in the four-point function, that's what this means, and they are basic, they are, um, technically two different ways to measure the lensing. And the other thing is that the primordial CMB, um, when you fit that with lambda CDM parameters, so basically when you fit that unlensed CMB with lambda CDM parameters, that predicts a certain amount of lensing. So what we're doing in this analysis is this three-way consistency check, checking that the amount of lensing you predict is exactly the amount you measure, both the two point and the four point. And I said that we were, uh, one of the motivations was that Planck found this interesting, I think it went up to three sigma deviation of excess lensing in their two point, in their power spectrum. So we were trying to check if we saw the same thing. So, um, so my little schematic with coffee cups is that, you know, lensing sort of messes you up and you want to know what was originally there basically so how are we going to go from this to this well we start with our great delensing analysis team so this is um dw han my grad student and amanda mckinnis my other grad student and alex van eaglen who's a faculty at um, arizona blake who's faculty at cambridge and Matt Madam-Shero at PI, who is outstanding and is on the faculty job market. So someone should grab them up. So you take this team and um, the first step to get from here to here is that we have to make the dark matter map. So we have to make the project, what we're making is a projected dark matter map in 2D. And so that's what we did in this analysis by using a standard technique where you just, as I said, you filter your CMB maps in a special way to look for the mode coupling that lensing induces. And you get this projected dark matter map where the black contours are the regions that have a lot of matter and the magenta contours are regions that don't have much matter. And so, so that would be your projected dark matter map um, in this picture here. Then the next step you do is that you're basically trying to run your movie backwards. You're trying to say, uh, well, I've got the CMB that I observed today and I've got my dark matter map. So now let me, you basically shift your pixels backwards in your image to make a map of what was originally there. And so we did this. And this is the map, which is a difference map because again, the fluctuations are so tiny that they're that little heartbeat. But what this map is, this is real ACK data. 
uh, not a simulation. First time anybody has made a map showing the difference between what we observe today and what was originally there. And um, if you overlay the dark matter map on top of it, you can see that it, that it nicely aligns. Oops, sorry, let me show you that uh, picture again. So you can see the nice alignment. And what you're seeing is that um, regions where there is a big difference between a matter and less matter, that's where you see the largest residuals. That's where you see the largest difference um, in your two maps between what you observed today and what was originally there. So, so now that we can make maps of what was originally there, the CMB map, our primordial CMB map, um, we can now get cosmological parameters from them. So, so this is cosmological parameters from de-lensed CMB spectra. In fact, this is the, the first time uh, anybody has obtained lambda CDM parameters from de-lens spectra. And what we're comparing to is the parameters from the lens spectra. And then we also have the Planck parameters over here. And we have the parameters from the full act data, which was actually um, twice as much data as went into our delensing analysis, because this was the first time we were doing the delensing analysis and it was already computationally challenging. So we used half the data. Um, so you'll see that the parameters are tighter here. Um, if you look at H non in specific, the error bars are tighter for the full data set. And then you can see the Planck error bars are even tighter. And then the other thing you might notice is why are the lensed um, error bars larger than the D-lens when I told you that D-lensing actually gives you tighter error bars? And the reason is because we did not combine the full um, information from the four-point function into this analysis. So that, that's a separate analysis that wasn't ready yet. So, um, when you do combine that full four point information, then these parameters will end up being tighter than these parameters. But basically it's because we've lost information when we de-lens, we lost information about the lensing, and we have to add that back in with the four point function to get tighter parameters. Okay, so, so that's the one point. So now we have these parameters, but another thing that now you can do is you can say, are these parameters consistent? the lens and D-lens parameters, are they consistent within the Lambda CDM model, given that both are coming from the same patch of sky? So I've got one patch of sky, um, and I've got a lens map and a D-lens map, and if Lambda CDM is correct, they should give us the same parameters, each, whether it shouldn't matter if I'm using lens or D-lens. And so that's the other thing that we explored with this parameter shift. So you can just focus on this sort of matrix here. And um, what we're doing is basically um, calculating what the allowable shift is between um, parameters um, derived from the lens map minus the D lens. So we'll look at omega BH squared and we'll say, what do we measure with the lens spectrum? What do we measure with the D lens spectrum? And then we'll make simulations um, within the framework of Lambda CDM and characterize what is the allowable deviation. And you see we have the six Lambda CDM parameters here, but then we also have a whole host of foreground parameters um, and calibration parameters, et cetera. So we, we characterize this matrix and then we look at what our data says. So if I can break down this plot for you, because there's a bunch of information. Um, the blue and the orange lines are telling you the normal parameters you get from the lens and D-lens spectra with their error bars. And here in green is the Planck data for comparison. The dashed lines are telling you what the best fit parameters are from the lens and the D-lens data. And what the purple bands are showing is what is allowed from our correlation matrix, like our covariance matrix. So we used the difference between best fit parameters um, for this analysis, just because it was faster to calculate the best fit parameters um, instead of marginalized means. But what you can notice from this plot is that the purple 
uh, allowed error is much, much smaller than you would think if you just looked at these wide error bands. Because from these error bands, you would say, oh my God, how can I tell any difference in parameters between lens and D-lens? But the key is that because you're looking at the same piece of sky, um, the, the, cosm the sample variance is canceling. And so your allowable shift in the best fit parameters is actually very, very tiny. Um, and that's what's indicated by these purple bands. So the takeaway is that if these dashed lines deviated by an amount that's wider than the purple bands for any of these parameters, um, that would indicate that you've got a problem with lambda CDM or potentially a, some systematic effect that you didn't take into account. Um, so that's what we were checking. And, and of course, we would, um, we don't look at each parameter individually. We check that all, all the parameters in our covariance matrix um, are within the allowed separation. Okay, so, and here's another way to depict that. Um, if this plot is basically saying, if we, if the universe really had 20% extra lensing in the two point power spectrum, like Planck had measured, which would have corresponded to this green bar, which is extra 20% lensing. So a lensing amplitude of 1.2, we would have detected that at about two sigma. And if the universe had about 30% extra lensing in that power spectrum, we would have seen it at three sigma. And in, instead we find this gold band, which is basically that the amount of lensing we find um, in the two point spectra is completely consistent with, um, with expectations. So, um, so we, we did not find any deviation from lambda CDM. Now what is coming? So that was just with a subset of ACT data. So, so ACT has had you know, data back in 20, 2008 to 2010. The analysis I was discussing here is in the maroon. So that is um, the DR4 data. So that was from 2013 to 2016. That's when the observations were taken. And right now we actually have in the can all this blue stuff from advanced act. Um, where we've been observing since then. So we're now processing 2017 data to 2019 data, and that will be DR6. But we have a lot more data. And this data covers a much larger region of the sky, almost half the sky, as opposed to the analysis here, which was, which was actually only on 500 square degrees, the one that I was showing. So our error bars will tighten up a lot and and right now I would say we weren't really at the point yet to um, uh, make any definitive claims regarding this Hubble tension, but our new data should be able to weigh in um, more definitively on whether we see new physics popping up in the lensing sector. And then I wanna tell you beyond advanced act, there's the Simons Observatory. So it's a merger of ACT and the Simons Array. This is the Atacama Desert. This is the Saratoga Plateau. Um, right now, there's something over 100 million from the Simons Foundation and, and various universities. And the expected first light is in 2023. And so the plan is to have a buildup of a whole bunch of extra telescopes um, over here. So, and then beyond that, um, depending on what the decadal says when they weigh in in March, um, CMBS-4 is a proposed um, next generation experiment beyond that. So there's a lot of um, proposals in the pipeline and now let me discuss um, one more. So I wanna switch my attention a little bit. So we had been talking about measuring the dark matter distribution on large scales but let me talk about now measuring the dark matter distribution on small scales. So here's a little picture. Here's the backlight as the CMB. Here's a galaxy bending the light. And um, it's similar to how you can have um, more traditional galaxy lensing, like with the LSST or W first bending light um, because of a foreground galaxy. 
So our first attempt to go to small scales was um, this paper that Matt led, uh, Matt Metavichero, uh, who's at PI when he was a grad student with me. And what we did here was we stacked 12,000 galaxies, CMAS galaxies that had a mass of about 10 to the 13 solar masses. And so we stacked them, we found some signal, kind of small back then, uh, this was in 2015, 3.2 sigma, but, but great, okay. So now we saw that the CMB can show us, um, can measure masses of halos down to 10 to the 13. But what I wanna talk about now is measuring masses uh, that are even smaller than that. And what we're really talking about is below 10 to the nine, like 10 to the eight, 10 to the seven halo masses. So that's, that's pretty tiny, has never been measured before with the CMB. And, and why do we want to do that? Okay, well, we know we've got dark matter. I don't need to tell this crowd all the evidence. Um, and we only see it gravitationally right now. And we want to understand what this particle is. Now, the model that dark matter is a cold collisionless particle has been enormously successful. Uh, when you go to dark matter conferences, however, there's always a large part of the conference that discusses whether there is or is not a small scale crisis of cold dark matter. And the issue is that um, some of the predictions of this cold collisionless dark matter model on large scales um, don't match observations in the small scale regime. So here is an example of that. This is a simulation of a Milky Way halo. It's, it's a relatively old simulation now. Um, the visible part of our Milky Way would only be indicated by this blue circle here. And all this other stuff is actually dark matter uh, substructure. So these are all little dwarf galaxies that should be in our Milky Way halo. And you, and you would say, well, that's great. We can go out and measure all of these. And if we, if we find this number of, of small halos, that would be good confirmation of this cold collisionless dark matter model, which we call CDM. So we go out and do that, like DES has been going out and measuring these halos. Um, we've been measuring this for some time. And um, with, with previous measurements, it had always seemed like there was a problem. We would measure, so this is um, small halo mass and this is large halo mass. And it seemed like we were not seeing many halos at the small end compared to what was predicted by the cold dark matter model. So this was became to be called the missing satellites problem, or people like to call it the missing dark matter satellites problem. And um, people try and resolve it in a number of ways. So, so it is true that halos below about 10 to the eight solar masses shouldn't really form stars. So there's no real reason that um, an instrument like the Dark Energy Survey should have seen these halos or Sloan or anything else. Um, other solutions are invoking some sort of either warm dark matter, self-interacting dark matter, fuzzy dark matter. Basically, these are models that wash out structure on small scales, either through some self-interacting cross-section or because the dark matter particle free streams and, and doesn't clump as easily as cold dark matter. So um, my, going to too many of these conferences, what seemed clear was that we really had to have a way to robustly understand what the data was saying. Do we have a problem on small scales or not? Because um, it often seemed that the data itself was not conclusive. And one thing that was clear is you would want to measure um, dark matter on small scales with gravitational lensing. Because the problem is if you used any tracer like stars, well, as I said, those halos don't need to form stars. Um, if you used something like Lyman alpha, uh, the question is, do you understand all the baryonic physics that goes into Lyman alpha so that you're sure it's tracing the dark matter? 
So um, gravitational lensing has a clear advantage because it's independent of, of basically all the physics of ordinary matter and it probes the dark matter directly. Um, and um, well, before I say this, I'll say um, the advantage of using CMB lensing over galaxy lensing is that the CMB is everywhere. It's behind all the dark matter. You know exactly the redshift of the CMB. And on the scales we're talking about, you actually know the primordial CMB pretty perfectly. You know exactly what it's supposed to look like. And in fact, it, it kind of looks just like a gradient, a nice background gradient, which is basically ideal for measuring lensing. So the CMB has tremendous advantages over using galaxy lensing. But, here's my red thing, but you need a CMB instrument that has higher resolution than the CMB instruments to date. So Planck resolution was only five arc minutes. ACT and SPT um, go down to 1.5. SPT has gone down to one arc minute resolution. Uh, what we're talking about here is about 15 arc second resolution. So you need smaller, um, much higher resolution to probe the small, the small dark, dark matter structure. Um, but say if you have that, then what can you do? So here is again the dark matter power spectrum that I told you about before, our four point function. And here is a model of cold dark matter, here is in blue, and here's a model of fuzzy dark matter and magenta, and you can see it's lower because the structure is suppressed in this model. And you may have noticed my axes, these L multiples are actually an order of magnitude larger than what I had been showing you before. Usually we go to 3,000, and here I'm talking about 30,000. So, um, but, but if you had this data in black, then you could tell very well, um, do we have a small scale crisis of CDM or not? Like, is there a suppression? Are we missing these dark matter halos or are we not? And what you would require is a camera that's three times more sensitive than the proposed CMBS4 and with five times better resolution. So this is um, three times more sensitive and five times better resolution than the CMBS4 wide survey because CMBS4 is divided into a deep and a wide survey. And that new experiment is what we call CMBHD. So what you would require is first, you would wanna put this in the Atacama Desert because you would need to survey half the sky um, and you're not able to do that from the South Pole location. And, and then, everybody's seen that site. I just interrupt, that is the CCAT crime site right there. So most people in this group have seen it because I show this all the time. <laughs> well, so so um, if I understood CCAT crime is a little bit higher site, right? So this is Saratoko. No, 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 no. This is CCAT prime site. Oh, this is a CCAT prime site. It is. Fantastic. Okay. And it, and, well, it, and it doesn't look like that anymore because it's been leveled for the new telescope uh, for, for CCAT prime construction right now. Perfect. So it's flat. It's flat. But, but um, for and, I, and you know what, I am not 100% sure the elevation of CCAT prime, but it is higher than yep. ACT. That's right, right. it's 5,600 5, meters and okay. ACT is just under 5,100. Okay, so, I, so let me clarify one thing. This picture is just for visualization of the Atacama Desert, but I wanted to clarify that we do not need to be on such a high plateau as CCAT prime. Um, the specs for CMBHD are designed for the Saratoko plateau. So I wanted to clarify that because that's a huge difference in cost. Um, okay, uh, uh, just just to clarify that point. So we 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 the CCAT prime because they're going up to higher frequencies wants much more pristine atmosphere, and so they're higher. And our highest frequency is going to be 270 gigahertz, and our workhorse frequency is going to be 220. So we only need to be at Saratoga. Uh, okay. But thank you for clarifying that, that this is actually the higher site. But very good. So, so we want to be in the Atacama Desert. We want to be at the Saratoga site. And what we need is uh, two 
30 meter millimeter wave telescopes. And um, initially in discussions with like Mike Niemack and, um, and Phil Mousecloff and Simon Dicker, who are the, the three people that really helped a lot with the instrument design, uh, they were hopeful that all the detectors that were needed to achieve three times um, higher sensitivity could be fit on one 30 meter telescope. But um, for a variety of reasons, um, we actually split it into two 30 meter telescopes because, um, because of making sure that there's enough space for all of the detectors and not getting overly ambitious. So, so two 30 meter telescopes are required to house um, the detectors and what's required for this sensitivity is um, if you want three times more sensitivity, you need 10 times more detectors than CMBS-4. So basically each 30 meter telescope would hold um, 800,000 detectors, but each pixel is four detectors. Um, so two colors and two polarizations. So only uh, 200,000 pixels for each telescope. I shouldn't say only, these are large numbers. Uh, okay, great. But what do you get for all of that? And um, so you can focus here on the red. So um, because this is a slide I, I took from a snow mass presentation, it, it's emphasizing the particle physics right here. But the main science driver of CMBHD is dark matter. Um, and I showed you this picture here. So dark matter in three ways. Uh, one is CMB lensing, measurement of the dark matter distribution. That's this plot. But another thing that is an equally um, powerful science goal of CMBHD is measuring N effective. And what this parameter, this is shown in this plot here, what this N effective parameter is telling you is basically, are there any light particles in the universe that were in equilibrium with standard model particles, um, basically at any time all the way back to the Big Bang. And so the reach of CMBHD so far, so this x-axis is basically time. This is uh, late times, like now, and this is early times. This is back to the Big Bang. And the reach of CMBHD is so low, it goes beyond all of these curves, all the different possible options for particles. So it can basically rule out at two sigma any new light particles that existed in the universe all the way back to the Big Bang that were in equilibrium with standard model particles. And that's important for probing new particles, you know, like a number of neutrino experiments have found anomalies and you know, there are suggestions for maybe fourth neutrino. But that's also important for dark matter models because a number of dark matter models predict in addition these light particles that would have been hanging around in the early universe. And then another thing I'm not showing a whole plot for is axion constraints, actually constraints on axion-like particles. And these are pretty well-motivated um, dark matter particle candidates and CMBHD actually has multiple techniques to rule them, to constrain them. Um, another very large science goal is, is inflation. So we discussed just looking for non-Gaussianity in the CMB. Um, something I'm pretty excited about is measuring primordial magnetic fields with CMBHD to actually constrain inflation. And this might actually be um, a more interesting smoking gun signature of inflation than, than even primordial gravity waves. Because if you have primordial magnetic fields that are higher than some level on large scales, the only way, almost basically the only way you could have generated them is through inflation. So I'm working on this with a current postdoc. I'm pretty excited about that. And then of course you can measure primordial gravity waves if you pair CMBHD with, for example, small aperture telescopes at the South Pole. So um, it, CMBHD is nice in that uh, it's so sensitive, it allows you to reach the delensing levels you would need to have um, CMBS4 type constraints on primordial gravity waves if you just add these additional telescopes in the South Pole. 
And then, of course, CMHA can probe dark energy in the usual ways, measuring structure with lensing, TSE, KSE, and also neutrinos. And then this, which should really get its own slide, <clears throat> but CMHD is really ideal for probing um, planets and dwarf planets in our solar system because of its resolution and because of the fact that we, we can make um, maps with a high cadence daily, for example, and also can probe transient phenomena in our skies, um, maybe even um, probe neutron star mergers before we even detect them with other probes like LIGO. And then, um, and then astrophysics because we have all the KSC and TSC measurements in there. So we've submitted a bunch of reports to the Decadal. Um, you can check out more information at this webpage and we are submitting a white paper also to the snow mass process, which is the particle physics um, counterpart to the Decadal. And I, I did discuss the instrumentation already. So 230 meter off axis cross are going to telescopes, um, 200,000 pixels, 800,000 detectors each. Um, Saratoko um, in the Atacama Desert and the surveys is 50% of the sky, seven and a half years um, with 0.5 micro K arc minute in noise, 15 arc second resolution. So the CMBHD collaboration currently has about 55 people. It's very open if you're interested in joining um, and roughly will follow the, the open collaboration style of the Rubin Observatory. Now to discuss price tag, right now, uh, if you scale up the DOE cost of CMBS4, then to build CMBHD, it's about is a, is a billion dollar project. CMBS4 is about $600 million project. Um, the largest, by far the largest cost of that is the detectors. And so that's why um, developments with MKID detectors are so exciting. And I know CCAT Prime and BlastTNG and Toltec are fielding um, a number of arrays with, with MKIDs to investigate their performance at millimeter wave frequencies. But the reason why it's so exciting is because MKIDs are much, much cheaper to build. And at least that's my understanding. And so that could reduce the cost of CMBHD enormously. Um, and, and I think they're easier to build as well. Yeah, the, so, the, detectors um, are, the detectors are cheaper, but the readouts are incredibly. <laughs> that's I, okay. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about the readouts, but um, but people are very, I mean, from I hear people are very excited about the promise of MKIDs in general. So so anyway, it was costed assuming traditional um, technology that's known to work, but the point is that there are potential avenues for reducing the cost significantly. And um, it is such a large project that it would require the DOE system the laboratory system for making the detectors and the instrumentation. And, um, you know, Simon Dicker at least is optimistic with two years of design and two years of construction. The survey um, would need to be about seven and a half years. Um, but what's also nice is that there are a number of experiments that are advancing a lot of technology already in testing it. So for example, we need these 30 meter dishes and um, you would want each, each panel of the dish to have adaptive um, technology so that each panel could move independently um, so that you could characterize your beam, for example, and have stable beams. So the Green Bank Telescope, for example, which is a 100 meter dish, is trying to explore such technology um, um, with um, an adaptive metrology system. Simon's observatory is going to, well, will need to advance um, these large um, uh, cryogens. And if they're successful, then CMBHD would use similar technology. And then, as I mentioned, the CCAT prime last TNG and Toltec are exploring the MKID technology. So there are a number of current experiments 
that are exploring the technology that CMBHD would need. Um, but other than that, there are no large technology hurdles, to my understanding. Okay, so in conclusion, um, I hope I've at least impressed that lensing is a new frontier for physics. So um, we've just now presented the first parameter constraints from D lens spectra. And certainly with experiments like CMBS4, and then if CMBHD comes down the pipe, D lens spectra are going to be where it's at. That's going to give you the tightest parameters from LAM to CDM. I, we, we've also presented a way to search for inconsistencies with the Lambda CDM model or look for new systematics because systematics are going to be really challenging with all these experiments. And so um, this lensing consistency test is also a way to see if we understand all our instrumentation and everything happening. And um, CMB lensing, high resolution CMB lensing is a new way that we can also probe the structure of matter on small scales and hopefully provides good motivation for the next generation CMB experiment. Okay, that's all I have to say. Are there any questions? Thank you, Nilema. Uh, nice talk and right on time. Uh, let's give a virtual or manual applause uh, to Nilema. And uh, uh, any question, you can raise your hand uh, and I can call you out. Let me see. Uh, Neil, you want to go ahead? Yeah, hey, Neil. Uh, yeah. Hey. Uh, so I came late. I'm sorry. Uh, so I was just wondering, you know, um, in the first part of your talk, which I missed, I was wondering if you had any comment about this, like sigma eight uh, uh, tension, you know, and specifically yeah. whether or not uh, you know CMB lensing can cast light on this. Right. So. Um, so in terms of the parameters, so um, as Neil is saying, that's why we highlighted these two down here. So, so Planck measured the sigma eight and H naught, and then other experiments like kids um, were measuring a lower sigma eight, and then other experiments like Adam Reese were measuring a higher H naught. Um, so, we find sigma eight values that are all consistent with um, with Planck. Um, so even if you just compare our, our DR four analysis, we will be able to actually say much more because our Planck's lensing analysis was forty sigma, and we're expecting well, at least sixty sigma, something higher, significantly higher than that with our DR four and DR six analysis. So I. Uh, but just to clarify for me yeah. here, uh, yeah. like, uh, so these sigma eights, these are from the CMB primaries as opposed yes. to the CMB lensing. That is correct. Yeah, Nothing I here has folded in the, the lensing auto spectrum. So the analysis that we're working on now is to combine the two point and the four point auto spectrum, lensing auto spectrum analysis together, which will give tighter constraints. And then in that case, when we combine that information, you'll actually, you should find the tightest constraints from the D-Lens spectra when we add back in the four-point information. So you might have missed, I said one thing, right now you might wonder why the D-Lens error bars are larger than the lensed ones, and that's because we, we didn't add back in the four-point information. So what happens when you D-Lens is you lose the lensing information, then you have to add that back in separately with the four point function. But in the green et al paper, which Dan Green points out nicely, you always gain information by doing the delensing process and getting, and you get some tighter parameters. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. So, so, um, I guess I was just, you know, wondering what the, you know, what the projected I guess like error bar, you know, on sigma eight from CMB lensing specifically alone, 
you know, would be? Um, I, it's hard. So I think that we w could double on what Planck does in terms of significance. So they have like 40 sigma and I, I we're forecasting, you know, in the like hundred-ish sigma with ACT. So we've got a lot of data in the can. So I okay, think we should be able to say some, we will go beyond Planck for sure. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, Right, but the Planck, you know, CMB lensing can't really distinguish between these two different sigma uh, Okay, uh, I see. So, like, so you forecast that with ACT, you'll be able to maybe cut the error bar by about a factor of two, you're saying? Yeah, I can, you know, so that analysis is being led by Blake Sherwin's group and Alex Van Evelyn, and I can ping them by, or, or Matt actually could probably give you, like... I was just curious, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I... It, it'll be exciting. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah. Any other questions? Could I follow up? And I got confused. What's the difference between primary lensing versus CMB lensing? So I thought they're all due to dark matter along yeah. the way. Oh, no, no, so. sorry. Like, by primaries, I just meant, you know, sigma eight coming from the amplitude of the power spectrum, you know, measured by the CMB, you know, as opposed to the lensing power spectrum. He, he just meant like the difference between two point and four point that we were talking about. So, okay. pro, so CMB, he meant two point and lensing, he meant the four point that you get when you filter in this way, et cetera. And I have a basic question. So I understand how you could de-lens the power spectrum or that. I don't understand how do you reconstruct the map itself? Isn't that like a realization? Do you have to? So um, what's neat is that so in this slide here, so what's neat is that lensing causes a very specific mode coupling. So it does something very, very specific that you, you exactly know what what it is, and this is what Chris Herrada and Wayne Hu, et cetera, figured out and, and Matthias and Yorosh. And so when you filter looking for that exact mode coupling between multiples, then you can pull out this estimated map of the projected dark matter. So, um, so I think Wayne Hu like, wrote down the proposal and then Chris Hirata worked out from first principles with GR why it works. Um, but that's that's basically what it is. You're looking for the specific mode coupling. And, um, and then it's very useful because I, I can also change the filter and look for all different kinds of mode couplings. Like I can look for birefringence or I can look for patchy reionization. So it's like you insert your favorite mode coupling and then you're just basically looking for that in your map and then you output an estimate of, of the thing that causes that mode coupling. Is that? Is that like you built up the filter and out of that the mode coupling and then exactly. you see, like that's an algorithm that produces exactly. the best so, fit, okay. So like the Hu and Akamoto paper <clears throat> is basically telling you the optimal filter to reconstruct the best um, estimate of the dark matter. And I should tell you now what's at the forefront of CMB is, is questioning the optimal filter as we get into regime where we have um, higher resolution and lower noise. And so now um, people are, are investigating all other techniques that they claim can actually be much better than this optimal filter. like machine learning techniques or forward modeling techniques or various other maximum likelihood techniques. So now the standard technique, um, like a lot of the young people are saying, well, we can do much better. So. I see. And also you mentioned the uh, inflation. What is the projected, like FNL you mentioned deviation yeah, yeah. on what values? Great. Um, so, so S4 can actually do pretty well. I don't think they sell it very right? like as much as they could. Let me get, but for CMHD, we could get FNL of about um, 0.23. And Morris, Morris at there at PI is basically the one to ask about all of this though. Um, 
I should just, I'm like flipping through all my slides. I should. Okay, well, he's the one that did the forecasting. So um, he estimated FNL of 0.26 for CMBHD, but something like 0.4 even for CMB S4. And what for? Uh, and so this uh, is using an overlapping um, LSST survey. That's my understanding. I see. And for uh, uh, tensor to a scalar ratio, what value is how small? Um, so for the tensor to scalar ratio, basically, if you put so CMBS four has eighteen small aperture telescopes and an, uh, and then a wide uh, telescope. So the eighteen small aperture they put in the South Pole and the wide telescope they put in the Atacama Desert. So if you have still those eighteen small aperture telescopes then you can get exactly the same primordial gravity wave constraint as CMBS4, which is um, sigma r 5 times 10 to the minus 4. And what CMBHD will do is instead of de-lensing de one little patch of sky, which is what the CMBS4, y, uh, CMBS4 survey is doing, it actually will de-lens half the sky and remove 90% of the lensing. So it's forecasting. 10% residual lensing over 50% of the sky. So basically it's like your de-lensing machine. And then you can put your small apertures, you can focus it on any piece of the sky you want. So. Okay, thank you. I think we've been a little bit over time, but I really appreciate uh, accepting our invitation. Just, can I just ask one yeah, more question? Yeah, sure, go ahead. I'm just curious about what the effect of Rayleigh scattering might be. Is that Rayleigh something that's gonna affect <clears throat> It's yeah. It suppresses the smallest scales, but maybe that's you're at too low a frequency for it to matter. I don't know. <coughs> um, you're saying, well, so Rayleigh scattering, from what I know, is um, work that was done by Joel Miles, Joe Myers, um, Dan Mirberg, and um, I think they were the primary people. So. Actually, Rayleigh scattering would be an effect that would actually help us, in fact, um, to get tighter and effective constraints because it's basically um, an effect that's a little bit different at different frequencies. So, so I would love to take advantage of Rayleigh scattering. And if we had more higher frequencies, we could do even better. Um, but I don't think I, I don't know if it would hurt us at the scales that we're talking about here in terms of you're, you're saying it would smear out some of the signal at small scales. Yeah, it suppresses small scale anis anisotropies, but it is, right. but but it is very frequency dependent. It goes as new to the fourth. So. Right. But remember, for us, the CMB, we actually don't want any primordial CMB. The, what you should, the picture you should have in your head is the CMB is just some background sheet. And in fact, when we do this analysis, um, well, okay. Uh, I mean, what, what's really happening is we've got the background sheet that, that we want as pristine as possible without any fluctuations. And then it's actually the structure, the intervening structure that's causing the distortion. So any suppression in anisotropy, that anisotropy that's happening at the last scattering surface, I don't think would be any problem, right? The, the cleaner the background is and the more true to pure gradient, the better for us. Yeah, that's probably right. Yeah, I don't really, that's not really my field. I've just been reading about it recently. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Nilma. Any other questions or well, I have can, Neil, can you stay on the line? Because I have a dark matter question for you. Okay. I let everybody else who likes to leave um, <laughs> give another round of applause to Nilima and whoever wants to stay can stay on my <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for having me. I'm not sure but so Neil, I have a question about this paper that came out and because there are no conferences, I don't know what's the final word, but so Catherine Zurich had this paper on pulsar timing arrays and she was basically claiming 
that like every technique I think that's focused in the Milky Way is not is going to have a challenge because of this tidal stripping. And she had some tidal stripping model where like all the halos are basically gone. And so I don't know if you've seen her paper. And um, well, uh, uh, this depends, I guess, on where you're trying to probe these substructures. Uh, right, like stars, I guess they must be trying to probe within the disk of the Milky Way. I'm not quite sure what pulsar timing array does. Maybe so. So it is true. She has this tidal stripping model where she's like within some Earth radius. Then you know, I mean, so I guess within like eight eight kiloparsecs, all these halos are gone. And she doesn't really say what happens in a larger radius. But if you saw her abstract, she makes like this really bold claim where she says something like every technique is doomed basically and can't even constrain land to see yet. Like she, I, I don't know if you noticed or something. And I was wondering like, has there been any, like I emailed her and I was like, but I didn't get a response back. So I don't know if there's been any interaction like have people commented on her title stripping model saying like this is too severe or she didn't model it right or something like that? Well, so again, I mean, uh, well, well, right, like, like, no, so, so for pulsar timing, you know, like, you know, so, like, so, so presumably she's looking at pulsars that are living within our disk, you know, but for other probes of this substructure, like, for example, you know, tidal streams or strong lensing, you're probing subhalos that are quite far from the, you know, you know, like, you know, from the central stellar disk, right? Uh, so it's possible that she's assuming like very strong stripping due to the lots of stars, you know, in the disk, but those stars never go out to 30 kiloparsecs, you know, okay. where the tidal streams are or the intergalactic space, you know, you know, probed by strong lensing, mm -hmm. right? Uh, yeah, I mean, Right, so it's possible that you know, like, you know, uh, so it's possible that she's, you know, you know, uh, you know, um, that she's assuming a lot of stripping, you know, just because she's focusing on regions where stars have very strong tides. Would would this be a problem though for that hel helometry method using the Gaia data? Or I, yeah. actually, you know, it's a problem for that model anyway because I think that model can only detect. Um, more substructure than lambda CDM, not less substructure. Well, the same is true, you know, for this pulsar timing, right? You know, so this pulsar timing is not sensitive to lambda CDM substructure. It's only sensitive if you have subhalos that are much, much more dense than is predicted by lambda CDM. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, so I will effectively ignore ignore that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, right, you know, I mean, right. I shouldn't uh, disparage Catherine because we're, you know, doing this proposal together with Ruben. Uh, right. but, uh, well, okay, like, you know, but I will note, you know, that for example, for a long time, you know, you know, you know, they weren't aware that, for example, you know, well, okay, like, like, you know, like at first they wanted to use, you know, lensing of the pulsars to detect subhalos, right? And they weren't aware that, for example, you know, lensing becomes, you know, insensitive, you know, for wavelengths that are large compared to the Schwarzschild radii of the lenses. Mm -hmm. You know, so they had these like papers claiming these like grandiose constraints without realizing that it was all wrong. And right. like, you know, multiple times I and many people tried to explain to Catherine that no, you know, lensing doesn't happen, you know, for wavelengths that are large compared to the Schwarzschild radius. And well, she didn't really believe us. Okay, okay anyway, yeah, so I'm not, yeah, so I'm just saying that you know, so as usual, you know, don't trust, you know, you know, like, like, you know, as like, you know, as usual, don't trust one source, you should, you know, talk to multiple people. Right, right, right. Well, I'm asking. So maybe I can comment a little bit. I mean, I'm guessing, I mean, this is a statement that any way of probing a small scale structure is a bit strong. But I mean, one thing that uh, I looked at, which wouldn't suffer from this, is if you look at cosmological variable sources uh, that are small. Now, we looked at quasars uh, that are variable. Uh, and uh, I mean, so there you're not talking about substructure in the disk of the galaxy that could be, right. but right. you're talking about substructure yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. 
You mean right. lensing though again, right? Yeah, yeah, you know, strong yeah. lensing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. I think she ignored all that. So she, there was sort of a very strong statement in the abstract, but I think it it didn't take into account lensing techniques in general. I mean, yeah. I think probably with the gravitational waves, that might be the new frontier because that we are, we are seeing the extremely tiny things, uh, which uh, from cosmological distances. Yeah, but, that's right. But again, though, you know, like the wavelengths are large and so you're only sensitive down so to some the, range of masses right so the wavelength of the gravitational waves is long is that what you're saying yeah yeah so co compared to the Schwarzschild compared to Schwarzschild radius is that what you're saying so, so like what would be the mass range that would probe them well uh what, yeah what is it so so for so for LIGO what the the frequency is well like 10 hertz or something yeah so the yeah, hundred. hundred hertz. Okay, so uh, what is that? So, to, so a few thousand kilometers is the wavelength. Okay, right. Okay, good. So therefore, yeah. So right. So therefore, like you know, down to like I guess like ten to the three solar masses or something. That okay. Well, that's right. Yeah. Bad. Okay, right. So is yeah. that so? So ten to the three solar mass. I, I see what you're saying. Okay. So, so how that, would you know that's not like a black hole or something? Um, oh, I mean, it would be great if we saw intermediate solar mass black holes in huge abundance, wouldn't it? I mean, then it would be amazing, wouldn't it? <laughs> no, no, that would be great. That would be great. But then for dark matter. Oh, well, no, I mean, well, right. So if you saw one thing, yeah, I mean, you don't know. But if you see like lots of quasars have this and it's not just one black hole, it means that, yeah. you know, some, you know, like, 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 you know, it means that there's like some abundance of these perturbers required, and then you can, I mean, right, you know, and that then tells you like the fraction of like omega matter it has to be, right? So, so for quasar, sorry, for gravitational waves, then you say it would be 10 to the three solar masses, but then if you are talking about, I guess, just optical light, uh, that would be much smaller. So then I guess the limitation would be something else. I guess that's the size of the source, presumably, right? Yeah, that's right. So for us with Alma, that's right. So our limitation at the low mass end is, you know, you know, is like the smoothness of the background uh, emission. Right. Uh, yeah. And then similarly for like the other ways of doing strong lensing. Yeah. I mean, it's something similar, right? So like, you know, for this like, you know, for this like spectroscopic strong lensing, I think it's like, you know, the size of like the narrow line region, you know, similarly limits you to, I think, comparable masses. Did you get a thousand solar mass as the no no larger a larger okay yeah wait what's your mass limit ten to the seven six five so for us for Alma yeah so uh, no no it's, it's it's larger it's like ten to the seven solar masses is our uh, you know um is our limit it's hard to go below that just because you know the the background sources are smoother than that. But if you take the emission region of quasars, I mean, you can go a smaller. I mean, I think you can get to, I mean, 10 to 100 solar mass. I mean, I think we did this at some point. Well, right. So if you take the continuum emitting a region for quasars, mm -hmm. you're sensitive even to like stellar microlensing. Uh, right. right. Yeah. You know, I mean, right. Like, like, right. Like, you know, you know, that's the reason why people try to avoid using the continuum emission from quasars because. I mean, you know, you know, because you can't really distinguish stellar microlensing from the sort of dark matter right. substructure. So that, uh, yeah, so the challenge, I, yeah, so the challenge would be distinguishing those two then. Yeah, that's right. You know, but for these like larger scale emission regions, like the narrow line region, for example, you know, they're big enough, you know, physically large enough, you know, you know, you know, that stellar microlensing should be negligible. That's uh, right. Whereas these like big sub halos are still like you know big enough Einstein radii. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That was the idea. But anyway, though, I mean, right. But for like, yeah. But for like tidal streams and for this sort of strong lensing, yeah. Uh, you know, the sort of destruction I think that Catherine maybe is worried about within the disk of our own galaxy, you know, shouldn't be so important. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Okay. All right. Good to see you, really. Good to see you. See you. Bye bye. See you in person at some point. See you. Hope